I think it's important as coaches, especially older coaches, that we have to realise that, do you know what? We are potentially father figures to these players. They're projecting fatherhood on us. And, you know, if they've had a shitty fatherhood or the dad wasn't around, you know, that they'll project that onto us as well. You know, you could have some players within your your football or your rugby team who, as a kid, were interrupted all the time. Their opinion didn't matter. They were never given a voice. And for the rest of the teenage years, they just shut down. They just got on with it and didn't speak. Employees don't leave organisations. Employees leave managers. That's a fact. And, and that's based on research by Gallup. So if someone's not been managed well and treated as an individual and made to feel that is an important part of the team and he has an input and he has his, his opinions are accepted and developed as an individual, they're less likely to leave the team. So Craig White, welcome to the podcast. My first question is what empowered you to explore high performance? Oof. Um, well, it starts off, as a young child, really, you know, I grew up in Wigan with a rugby ball in my mouth and, um, you know, bred into the world of rugby league and living in a town like Wigan, one of the ways out of the kind of dundrums of working class Northern life is, is through professional rugby league. So I always wanted to be a professional rugby league player and I was kind of put on that track by mother, father and the uh, society where I grew up. And um, I guess always strive to be better from a, a young age. Um, played at a decent level, rugby league, didn't sign professional. And then the next trajectory trajectory for me was to uh, go into work as a coach in professional rugby. I, I, I realised when I was about 19, actually, I did my first coaching qualification when I was 16 as part of my GCSE, rugby league coaching level one. And, uh, and I loved it. And I realised when I left school that I got much more joy from coaching people than I did from playing. I coached my first school team when I was 19. So I started off young as a coach and that experience made me realize uh, that playing wasn't for me. Coaching was for me. And uh, I guess that's where the pursuit of high performance came from, even though you and I know that term is thrown about quite a lot. And what does it even mean? Absolutely. We'll dig deep into that terminology in a moment, but I want to kind of bring you back to, to your point where you said that you did your first qualification at the ages of 16 and had a an early coaching career, and which which led you on to kind of elite performance and, and, and the area that you're in now. Talk to me about that in terms of maybe you going into that environment at a young age, imposter syndrome, maybe dealing with people older than you. How did you cope with that? Um, yeah, that's a very good question. Um... I mean, my first elite gig, if you like, I mean, I, I was lucky enough to work alongside a guy called Andy Clark that, that was one of the first full-time conditioning coaches within professional rugby. He's now an agent, but he was a conditioning coach. He's the brother of a guy called Phil Clark that was a famous Wigan Rugby League player. I was, I was lucky, lucky enough from probably the age of about 22 to 25, 26 to shadow him. So I wasn't kind of grey behind the ears, but my first proper gig was actually with the Irish rugby team. I was the first full-time SNC coach to to live in Dublin and to work with the Irish team. They'd had part-time guys before that, and I was only 26. So, um, of course, 26, national team started professionalism. What do you do? There was a lot of trial and error. I remember, I remember one of my first internationals um, and I remember being at Lansdowne Road. I can't remember who we were playing against. It was the Six Nations, and I was warming the subs up behind the sticks, and I had them doing kind of forward rolls. And and every time we did a forward roll, the whole crowd would go, "Oh!" And so I I, I stopped doing that pretty quickly. So I, I guess yeah, um, imposter syndrome. It, I mean, it's associated with the emotion of fear. It either breaks you or it acceler accelerates you, and. Uh, I think with me, it was more of an accelerator, really, to kind of show up and, and do a good job. But I'm sure I made a lot of mistakes because nobody knew what to do in those early days. I was involved in professional rugby three years before it turned professional. And then I was involved at the turn of professionalism. So it's like what, what we did 
was a mystery really in those like, early years. In terms of making those mistakes and trial and error, how did you self-reflect? Was that kind of important for you in terms of your journey to become a, a better coach? What, is there anything that you kind of learned? You mentioned your mentor as well. Is there anything that you, you absorbed and, and learned about yourself to, to, to become better at what you do? Um, I mean, mentors are really, really important. You know, I've been lucky, lucky, lucky enough to have mentors along the way. And without that, it would have been a, a tricky route. So mentorship is really, really important. Um, but like I said, you know, in those early days, there wasn't that many of us around, to be honest, like there is today. I mean, you, you and I know the world of performance coaching is vast and there's not many opportunities and the, the people vying for professional places in a professional sports team is huge but it never used to be. There was only a few guys around. And um, like I just said, in those early years, it was just see what works well. Um, I went from working for Ireland to working for Bolton Wanderers in the Premiership. And um, then I went from there to work for London Wasps for three and a half seasons. And it was it was actually a beautiful time in my career it was we were very very successful we turned around mediocre performances and then we won everything and then we won doubles and european cups and and, all, and we won the title every season when i was there but um it was difficult to pinpoint them if we did make any mistakes because you're winning all the time but looking back we probably did make a lot of mistakes because i believe that we probably broke a few players you know, we the, we and we'd have the academy players doing weights every single day, because at the time we thought that bigger and strong was the way forward, um, and it may have been in that transitional period. But looking back, um, the the gym program was pretty barbaric, and um, I, I wouldn't probably do as much volume today as what I did back then. Mm -hmm. You talked about your experience within Bolton and then that transition back into rugby. Is there any differences between the two sports in terms of maybe yeah. physical overloads, as you mentioned, but also maybe mentally as well? Is there anything that you kind of discovered during that uh, experience? Well, yeah. The, the, I mean, this, you know, every family, every organisation has a culture, doesn't it? And, um, you know, definitely the culture of rugby even though it's changing now, but back then the culture of, of rugby was, it was more hard nose. It, it was more, come on, we've got to work, we've got to work, we've got to do more work, we've got to do more work. And, you know, with, within football, because arguably, and it is an argument, but arguably, I would say that in professional rugby, if you've got a decent amount of talent, and you work your balls off, and you're diligent, and you're a good learner, you can actually make it far in the game. But, I mean, you work in a football university. In football, you know, if you've not got the touch, you know, we talk about the touch in football, don't we, a lot. If you haven't got the touch, it doesn't matter how hard you work, you ain't going to make it to the top. I think because of that, because there's a kind of, there's definitely more of a talent slash skill component to becoming a super world-class footballer um, that there's less emphasis naturally, you know, on building yourself up and doing gym and all those kind of things, because it, you know, the beauty of a world-class football player is they love playing football. They love the touch. They love skill. They love kicking a ball around. It's important. I think not to take that away. So again, that's a long way of answering your question, but I think um, there's definitely more flair in football. And I think the challenge with that sport is, is, is you know, having a high performance program, but not taking that away from from the program. But in rugby, you know, you can you can manufacture a rugby player more than what you can manufacture a good soccer player. Okay, so I get the sense that there's a lot more components to a elite football player in comparison to maybe a rugby player, and that differs in terms of maybe your training and outlook towards that. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, the, okay. the need for finesse and skill is 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 so much more important in football than it is in rugby. Mm -hmm. But obviously, there's positional difference as well, and that's a it's a big that's a very general general way of answering your question. 
Mm. Talk to me about culture then. Um, and one thing that I picked up on in, in terms of exploring you was this term masculinity and how we kind of dissect masculinity down oh. to uh, think about maybe well-being, etc. Is there anything that you've noted in terms of maybe rugby and football that uh, is a bit of a, um, a cliche within those male dominant environments where masculinity is strong and a sense of winning and power? And you mentioned then in your answer around uh, a ruthless nature towards success that is is needed to be kind of dissected and, and looked at differently in, in modern sport. Um, it's interesting you've asked that question. Um, so... Some of my work now is is in is still in rugby, and some of my work is with leaders and and coaches. But but a lot of my work is is in it, if you like it, still the field of men, but more around mental wellness and self development and leadership, and um, you know, being more authentic as men and stepping into our true potential. And you, I guess you could say, even though it's only our mental construct that separates things, I guess you could say what I'm doing within the kind of sphere of men's work is a bit more spiritual than what I was doing in the rugby work, even though there's similarities, but, um, I mean, men are men, right. And whether you're in a football team or you're in a hockey team or you're in a a boardroom or you're in a, a rugby team, you know, we all have inherited an ancestral kind of, identity stereotype rule book around what it means to be a man and there's obviously on a global level there's different countries have different cultures but where you and i come from and the sports that play soccer and rugby they're quite similar so whether you're playing football or you're playing rugby you know that the stuff that we bring into that domain as men is quite similar and often it's um without labeling as right or wrong um, you know, we all download that kind of patriarchal influence of, you know, don't cry, don't show emotions, don't show feelings, don't be a tough guy, don't be a wuss, get on with it, um, give me a target, give me a mission, tell me a roadmap to get the, you know, program design, profiling, all this kind of stuff. It's a very stereotypically masculine way of looking at things. Um that obviously relates to performance because performance is about getting better, getting from A to B and and creating, if you like, a new identity and a new way of performing. So it requires system and it requires structure and it requires some kind of organizational pathway and methodology. So that's the, the, if you like, the domain of the masculine energetics. Well, there's a whole other domain of some people might call it feminine energetics. I prefer to call it a kind of relational energetics, this kind of non-linear way of relating, non-linear way of thinking, non-linear way of connecting with people, you know, conversational skills, um, empathy, all, all the stuff that you and I may have associated with women growing up because that's what society taught us. But um, for me, in terms of developing people culture because obviously we've got processes and systems as well but in order to develop people culture there's a real need more than ever before and this does apply to performance for us to learn the skills of connection and the skills of vulnerability and the skills of some people call them soft skills uh, and love and unity and 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 supporting each other and you know all those kind of nurturing kind of motherly if you like instinctual ways of relating it might not it might not make you stronger and share a hundredth of a second off your hundred meter time, but it's definitely a big big component in building culture and for me the in 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 the sphere of rugby the 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 art the country the organization that the the team that does this the best from me from my perspective is the South Africans. You know, I look at the last World Cup final between England and South Africa and from the outside looking in, knowing inside information about those teams, I strongly believe, and this is debatable, but I strongly believe that the South African team were rooted to a deeper purpose, which was a culmination of each individual stories and what it meant for them to play for South Africa and the country and the whole political 
ancestral stuff related to that. But I also, and, and, and this is a generalization based on what I see in the footage of the South Africans, it just looks to me like they love each other. They really, really love each other as brothers. And that's what I'm about, that the word brotherhood is really important to me. And I just wonder, I'm English, I wonder if, number one, the English team are rooted to a really deep sense of purpose. And number two, if they really love each other. And number three, if they have the right people in the management team that can foster that type of loving environment where there's an equal amount of support and challenge and there's an equal amount of love and and, uh, and, and, and drive. Do you feel maybe from a leadership position is that these factors are hard to measure? So you mentioned in terms of maybe other disciplines, data and we can kind of measure uh, objectively on getting from a to b in terms of culturally how we measure these is is limited and do you think that might be the reasons why we don't value these areas as much as maybe other areas well well yeah and also um <sighs> don't take this the wrong way because i know that you know at the moment you're you're working in academia but yeah. Part of the challenge of relationships is the pursuit of wanting to measure everything for me. It's a very, very masculine way of looking at life and looking at relationships. And if, and if, so if, if, if you're my wife, right, and I'm your husband, really there's two aspects of the way we relate. Sometimes, Let's say, let's say, for example, you wake up and you're, you're, you're really in touch with the, your feminine side on this particular day. You know, you're soft. You feel a little bit sensitive. You can't really work things out. You just want to be, be with your feelings. In that instance, in that relationship, my capacity as a man in his masculine energy could help you. I could find a solution. I could tell you where we're going for dinner. I could get you ready. You don't have to worry about anything. I'm the fixer, okay? And I, and I can tell you what time we're going to go. So that way of looking at life is beneficial, okay? Yeah. But in order to deepen connection, I need the opposite skill set and I need the opposite energy. I need to drop one into fix. I need to drop one into find a solution. I need to drop one into find a process and a system and just be with you. Just be with you and not try to fix you. And you and I just don't think it's possible to measure that. It's a non-linear thing. It's a non-linear way of thinking. It's a non-linear way of feeling. You know, the world of emotions doesn't have any logic behind it. You know, and maybe a day comes where we can bring it back to a hidden order, of course, and a logic, but in the realm of human relationships, which is what we're talking about in, in sports teams, um, like I said in the beginning, most of us naturally can do the fixing systematic process related stuff, but we struggle in harnessing real empathic, raw human connection. And like I said already, I think the South Africans maybe have that more than a lot of other teams at the moment. How do we create a winning culture then, Craig? You kind of mentioned some facets then in terms of your answer, but what do you think are the key ingredients to build a high-performance winning culture? <laughs> um, I guess you've asked that question a lot, and, and I guess each time you've got a different way to look at it. Um in order for me to help myself to answer that um, and put a bit of structure behind it, I like to look at um, if, if I go into a new team and I'm charged with helping them to grow the culture, the most essential ingredient is trust. So if I'm a player, I'm going into that organization and I feel like the environment is, is relatively trustworthy. 
you know, I go though, I feel I can be I can be myself. I've got some friends I can be vulnerable with. I feel like people speak the truth. So there's an element of trust. But in order to build that trust, um, I like to look at things in a polarized way. Um, sometimes I give a presentation when I go into teams, it's called a polarity of culture. Dependent on the team in question, I might call it the polarity of brotherhood or the polarity of relationships. I might even call it the polarity of love if the team are open to, to that word, which some are and some aren't. And, the, and, and looking at an organization, one aspect of the polarity, one aspect of the culture is what I call support. So that's the good stuff. Put your arm on you. You're doing well. Let's go for this. It's, it's driven towards pleasure. It's driven towards celebration. There's high fives. We have humor. It, it's, it's a very kind of supportive way of building culture. On the flip side of that is the opposite, but the complementary opposite, which is challenge. It's the constructive feedback. It's the hard yards. It's identifying consequences of poor performance. It's identifying limitations. It's um, ruth, being ruthless. It's goal-driven. You know, it's focusing on moving away from pain. And um, this is the way I like to look at organizations. And in my own career, um, you know, I've been with organizations that are too far this way. It's too catastrophic. There's too much challenge. There's too much pressure on the players. There's not enough of the other stuff. And I've been in organizations, uh, especially in South America with, uh, with Uruguay, um, who I've done a lot of work with before the last World Cup, we, I identified that it was too much this way. I've never seen a team that shows so much affection towards each other, you know, so much touch, you know, arms around each other, or linking each other, high fives, really soft kind of way of relating to each other. And there wasn't enough of, of the hard stuff. There wasn't enough of the eye of the tiger holding each other accountable. It was too supportive. So that's kind of, obviously, there's a lot behind the building of that and creating a, a balance point. But that's the way that I like to, to look at uh, building culture. There has, there has to be a equal amount of support and challenge in that relationship. Now, that relate, also relates to the relationship you have with yourself. Within ourselves and the way we, we treat ourselves, we need a mother and a father. The mother is the support. The father is the challenge. It's the same in an intimate relationship, and it's the same in any subgroup or large organization. We really need that uh, combination of support and challenge. How would you get people to buy into that then, Craig? Because there might be certain environments that are not very successful, and you are trying to yeah. develop ideas and thoughts to maybe think about performance, sport, even in employability in, in other industries differently. Um, the famous quote is you can't change the person, change the person. But yeah. I, I'm interested to hear your point of view on how you get people to buy into what you're trying to achieve, buy into these values, buy into these ideas to become better. Yeah. Because obviously there's a transitional period of trying to get people to invest and understand yeah. these different rituals that you've mentioned. How, how do you deal with that? Yeah, first of all, I think everybody's different and everybody has to be treated as an individual. Um but in, in, in getting, in, in achieving buy-in, um, I actually like the model of Stephen Covey. So the trust model, you know, he, he looks, I don't know if it's Stephen Covey Jr. It might be, but um, the, the book is, the, I think it's, I can't, I can't even remember what it's called. It's the something of trust. But anyway, it's a great book. And he talks about uh, two sides of trust. So you could have two players in your squad, for example, and I might be a player that is more likely to, to buy in if I receive information about how knowledgeable you are, how much experience you've got, what's your methodology, what's your track record. So all the linear stuff, if you like. If, so if I'm selling to you, I want you to buy into my program and you're this way inclined, I might say, well, look, we've got this incredible program. Look at all the equipment we've got. We've got the best sports science lab in the world. 
Um, this is my track record. I've got a coach here that's worked at the elite level. I've got an SNC coach who worked at the elite level. So if 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 he knows that there's knowledge in this system, there's methodology, there's clarity of direction, he might buy in. You could have another individual. That stuff doesn't mean anything to him. He wants more of the human side. He wants to feel you. He wants to feel your authenticity. He's, he's monitoring your character. He's monitoring your integrity. What you say, do you actually follow up on those actions? So some people cultivate a sense of trust in an organization through the character and the integrity of the individuals in that organization. And some are more prone to kind of information, technology, experience. And really, um, there's also other, others who are more prone to a combination of the two. So it's important that you provide, you know, like a bulletproof, shit up, you know, all singing, all dancing, high performance program. And at the same time, you know, you've got, especially from a, a staff perspective, you've got enough staff in your organization that understand how to connect to human beings and, and listen empathically and can really treat everybody as individuals. Mm. So it's useful within a management organizational framework to have your academics, to have your sports scientists, to have your linear thinkers, and to have an equal amount of non-linear thinkers who can really connect. I call them laptop coaches and human coaches. Hmm. I'm interested how you define success then, if you were to, to maybe work with organizations or people. Um, obviously, with the women's final that was on last weekend, there was a term used called success washing. So uh, a lot of people in terms of punditry mentioned that um, England's football team have done significantly well, but there's still a lot of challenges that, that uh, women's football face in terms of the pyramid of, of the game. Yeah. How do you go into an environment then if there is maybe a success happening for maybe a certain period at the top, but there are other areas that need to, to be addressed and looked at in terms of maybe a cultural environment. How do you do your due diligence on that? Is there anything that you pick up upon I to ensure it, that there's a togetherness? Yeah, I think it actually relates to what we just spoke about in terms of buy-in. Um, it's really important, especially in that pre-season period, to, from an integrated perspective, not a top-down perspective, which is what some teams still do, unfortunately, but from a really integrated perspective to really examine and workshop over a period of time what, you know, what success means and what success might mean in the different areas. You know, what does success mean from a, from a results perspective, from a fitness perspective, from a, a skill performance perspective, from a connection perspective, um, from a facilities perspective, you know, there's so many different components of success. So I think it's important to workshop that and get and get buy-in and more importantly, agreement, you know, real agreement on what that means. And for a Saracens, you know, you, you know, they want to win it every single year, but for a London Irish, it can be, it can be different. Um, so for me, that's really where success is at. And obviously you've got the individual components as well. So the importance of profiling not only the team, but also the different areas within the team and also mm. the individual is what does success look like for each individual. You know, mm. success for the captain of the team might be X amount of wins and X amount of England caps, but success for an academy player is obviously different to that. Um, but ultimately... Um, and again, it, it, even though we're talking about success, we're also talking about culture here because the more that individuals are treated as individuals, the more they're likely to buy into the program. Uh, employees don't leave organizations. Employees leave managers. That's a fact, and, and that's based on research by Gallup. They don't leave organizations. They leave managers. So if someone's not been managed well, and treated as an individual and made to feel that is an important part of the team and he has an input and he has his, his opinions are accepted and, and, and developed as an individual, the less likely to leave the team. Again, Saris do that well. That's why the player retention is quite good. Hmm, they're very interesting, that, that point. Um, I picked up on something on your, your profile when I was, was doing a bit of research on you and there was, there was something that, that was noted on your webpage was... Um, 
I'd been a workaholic for a long time with no space for self-reflection. That was quoted. Can you tell me a little bit about the importance of self-reflection to improve and, and enabling yourself as well as others to kind of self-reflect and, and how do we self-reflect as individuals? Yeah. Um, I mean, the importance, whether we call it reflection or whether we call it feedback, uh, is irrelevant, but um, feedback is everything. You know, without feedback, we're dead. We don't know if we're doing it. We don't see our own movies. We can't see every show. What we think we're doing it a certain way, but we can't. Um, so that's actually a really, really important part of my work uh, within a rugby team, for example, which I don't do a lot now, but I still do elements of it, is helping organisations to slowly build a culture where giving and receiving feedback becomes the norm. Now, unfortunately, there's a lot that lies behind someone's capacity to give and receive feedback, and it relates to our childhood. You know, you could have some players within your your football or your rugby team who, as a kid, were interrupted all the time, their opinion didn't matter, they were never given a voice, and for the rest of their teenage years, they just shut down. You just got on with it and didn't speak. So what's the fucking point? Because my dad interrupts me every two minutes. What's the point? Now, that type of individual won't seek out feedback. He might say, well, fucking coach never give me any feedback. That was, that was a shit club. But he won't seek it out. So it's important to go softly with the whole feedback stuff. Everybody deserves regular, regular feedback. But also, it's important to teach players and staff to ask for feedback as well. But that it's a pretty important domain, but a sensitive one. And it requires practice. Uh, to, to get good at giving and receiving back, you can't just say it. You can't just stand in front of a team and say, guys, look, to get better, do we agree that giving and receiving feedback is good? Yes. Well, go and fucking do it. Because there's too much unconscious stuff that will stop someone seeking out feedback and will prevent someone from giving constructive feedback. Also, you know, some people are even scared to give someone positive feedback. It's it's a really interesting psychological domain, but worth getting into, but it requires practice. And, and um, if I was a full-time coach with the team now, I would run workshops on this and role-play situations so they get used to giving and receiving feedback and, and teach them about hot debriefs and teach them about feedback models and but but practice it, mm. you know. Practice it. it, it it's um, it's a really important skill, and if it's good feedback, it will accelerate development. One thing I picked up on then, in terms of your answer, you mentioned that um, habits or habitual habits occur at a young age, and that impacts, in this case, feedback. Is yeah. there anything else that you've done in terms of maybe your practice that you've you've tried to think about maybe the early childhood of a, of a young athlete or, or a, a later athlete and you've tried to modify the way that they see the world to be or their behaviours or the way that they react to certain things and how, how is that done? I mean, the obvious one is, um, you know, without being too attached to a player and thinking that you are his father, I think it's important as coaches, especially older coaches, that we have to realise that, do you know what? We are potentially father figures to these players. They're projecting fatherhood on us. And, you know, if they've had a shitty fatherhood or the dad wasn't around, you know, that they'll project that onto us as well. So there might be trust issues. We've just got to be patient. But, you know, the world of professional, the world of sport, is a domain where healthy human transformation can happen. But it's also a domain where very unhealthy human transformation can happen. And in the world of rugby and football, you know, there's a lot of good stuff, but there's a lot of fucking old patriarchal shit that still hangs about. You know, don't be a wuss, disrespect of women. I mean, the amount of times I still go into rugby organisations and hear unconsciously, the way they talk about women, don't be a wuss. Also homophobia, don't be a fag. It still exists 
in professional sport and we need to change that. And I've gone off on a tangent there, but what I'm saying is we have a responsibility as coaches to step into that fatherhood role and realise that we're much more than a guy that's helping a player to increase performance. Um, so we've got a responsibility to sort our own stuff out as well. I think, I think every single professional coach should have regular therapy, coaching and mentoring as part of his career. Why do you think that's ignored then, Craig, in terms uh, of maybe therapy and, and mentoring, it, just to, to understand how we behave and act and well, think? Well, I don't think it's completely ignored. And the reason I say that is because of the, co the coaches that I work with. I, I love the work that I do with them. They're open-minded. I'm, I'm amazed by the way they think um, and how courageous they are to seek out help. So I think it's changing. But... The reason it's ignored is, is the same reason that um, I speak to seven men every single week and only two of them commit to a coaching program because of fear. You know, we don't want to admit there's something wrong. We don't want to admit we want to change. We don't want to admit we've got demons. We don't want to take our mask off. It's the same. It's the it's the man stuff. Um and it's tough because for years we've been conditioned to be stoic and to be emotionless and, and to put a brave face on. And it's, it still lingers, but it's changing. And it's great to see um, a lot more out there now in the world of social media on coach wellbeing and, and stuff like that. And, um, but, but I believe every coach at the top needs a therapist and a mentor for sure. What are the kind of common traits then if, if someone is to come to you around maybe therapy or just to maybe really dissect down who they are as an individual? Is there any kind of key traits within that performance environment that you've picked upon during your journey as a, as a, as a mental coach? Uh, loneliness is a big one. It's really fucking lonely at the top and it's not spoken about. It's really, really lonely. You know, if you're the head honcho, uh, you know, if you're a Warren Gatland, if you're an Eddie Jones, it's lonely. And these guys are characters, but it's a lonely, lonely, lonely place. So that's one. Um, the other need is work-life balance. Because a lot of these guys have wives and kids. Um, and they believe the wives understand them. But there's a hidden picture there. So for me, a lot of these guys, if I'm working with them, 60% of the time, we're not talking about rugby. We're not talking about performance. We're talking about relationships with family members and intimacy and uh, connection with, with the wives and girlfriends. So that's a big piece as well. Um, the other piece as well is, you know, we're living in an age now where there's so much information and there's so much potential growth for all of us but again guys at the top are sometimes not being totally transparent in the work environment for obvious reasons and and they, and they could come to someone like me just to be vulnerable and just to offload and just to kind of be, be really really courageous and get it out of the system which i think how, is useful how, how do you build that sense of trust then how do you enable that to transpire then is there anything that you provide in terms of maybe a setting or an environment that enables people to open up and think deeply about themselves it, it's 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 kind of same as what i spoke about earlier on you know that there's a there's a track record side to it there's my knowledge and experience and accreditations and all that kind of stuff um but outside that the the most important Practice the most important skill for any single coach out there or for anybody in relationship that wants to help someone is attunement. And what I, be, what I mean by attunement is if he's with me or if he's on the screen, I'm totally attuned with him. People, Some other people might call it presence. Some other people might call it I'm, I'm in an empathic relationship with him. But it's that, it's that attunement where I'm totally absorbed in the connection with him and, and I'm not absorbed in anything else.
and energetically his nervous system will start to feel safe because he knows I'm attuned with him. More importantly, on top of that, if we, if we talk about layers, you know, if I also am honest with him, if I'm empathic with him, if I reflect some of his story back to him so he knows I've listened to him and I'm on the right page, you know, these are these are the main ways to kind of harness safety between uh, between two individuals. Mm. Just to show you that I care, really. Mm, absolutely. And in terms of what maybe I said earlier, in terms of tracking that progress, you mentioned people working in high performance, people working in, in other sectors as well, where there might be certain things that trigger certain behaviours. There might be certain events that happen within the profession. How mm. do we, from your perspective, how do you track that and how do you measure that to ensure that there are key takeaways away from maybe the coaching session to support those problems that might arise the tracking of how things are going the tracking of culture the tracking of connection it's it's so difficult to measure when i think about the teams that i've been involved in and if it, there's a belief that we've got a great culture it's a feeling you know the nervous system feels safe the nervous system feels like it has a place in this environment, a sense of belonging. And, and you know, the, the, the physiology around that is subtle joy. It's trust. It's gratitude. So, it, I mean, we can obviously do questionnaires and stuff like that, which could help. But I've had this conversation before with a lot of people and you just have a sense of knowing. It's a felt sense that you're in the right place and you belong here. And it's a beautiful feeling of safety. Um, now, in terms of, you mentioned when problems and triggers arrive, which they always do in relationships. So I believe whether it's a relationship with yourself or your missus or a team or your kids, you know, there's always um, three parts to it. And again, it's important to educate a team about the trends that might happen. The first part is that, um, you know, you cultivate a sense of harmony. Everybody, let's say it's pre-season, everybody's having fun, there's no pressure at the weekend, you know what I mean? You're building trust, you have a few coffees at an end, there's a sense of, oh, this is fun, so there's harmony. The next phase is there's a rupture, right? Every relationship has a rupture. Now, the more successful relationships, marriages, um, business relationships, team relationships, the sign of success is how well they repair. So the repair process is critical in any team. That could be between two individuals. It could be, to be between certain individuals. There might be a general feeling that, that something's fractured. But identifying that and repairing that is critical. And, um, you know, it might be something as simple as sorry. It might be something around support. It might be a hard piece of information. It might be that something's not towing the line and they need some honesty. But, but the repair process is absolutely critical because you always have harmony, fracture, repair. Harmony, fracture, repair. And again, if I was in a team, if I had a full-time job as a player welfare officer or a mental skills coach or team building expert within a team, I'd educate them on this. There'd be a huge piece around relationships and the etym etymology of relationships and the repair of relationships. Um, because then people wouldn't spit the dummy out. They know what's happening. How has men without masks change you as an individual, your business, it's, your consultancy it's business? Made me, thanks for asking that question. I appreciate that. It's made me more compassionate. And, what I, and, and when I say compassion, I mean, I don't just mean it in a cognitive sense. I mean, I, it's enabled me to feel more. It's in relationships. It's enabled me to be more empathic because of what I've witnessed in some of the five-day programs that we do, you know, witnessing horrendous stories and but also witnessing magical transformations and um witnessing immense courage immense joy immense sadness immense grief immense gratitude 
immense euphoria. You know, just it, it's just made me more emotionally available. Um, and my reference point for that is is my body because you know emotions are the language of the body and thoughts are the language of cognition. So it, it's it's helped me to be more emotionally intelligent because I've I've felt things on a deep level. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And what would what would a individual um, explore? You mentioned your retreats. What what kind of activities would they would you do to enable them to kind of think differently about the world and, and about themselves? Um, so we use a loose model. You know, you know, models are useful as a reference point. Um, and, and we use a model that I, that that uh, we used to call the, the four archetypes, but now it's the model of the five centers of potential. So the first center of potential is the center of action, you know, getting shit done in the world, the sense of achievement. Uh, the second center is the center of feeling, which is an earth, which is a which is a domain that most men need to remember and need to relearn and need to reclaim because we've suppressed our feelings in pursuit of logic and making the master of life our intellect we, we've lost this capacity to really feel and non and explore non-linear ways of being and um and the third center the center of transformation which is about um our thinking actually and transforming our thinking process and the fourth center is the center of of the heart which is this kind of new model of leadership now there's a fifth center which I call the center of centers, but that's just about awareness and, and resting in our essence and exploring things like meditation and silence. And so, so we use this model, but within that model, um, I'll come to the specifics in a minute, but within the model, what I found over the years, we used to just talk. So we'd sit in circle a lot and just talk and it has its benefits but it also can keep, keep us stuck in cognitive loops. And what I found in the five-day programs that I offer with men is that transformation occurs in a more potent way when we do a physical practice followed by talking, a physical practice followed by talking, a physical practice followed by talking. Because as men, we, we live here. And the physical practice gets us into our body. It opens up our heart intelligence and our gut intelligence. And then when we talk, we're talking from the heart. We're talking from a centered place. We're not talking. We're not talking from past patterns or loops. Do you get that? Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's but it, but in that also in that model, um, it, it's quite difficult to say exactly what we do. There's components from the world of sports. There's components from the world of yoga, meditation, breath work, movement, shamanism. We connect with nature a lot. Uh, we do things that you you know you, we, we forgot and how to do things that we we should be doing with our uh, mates when we were kids. Um, so there's there's a lot of components. Somebody once said to me, "Well, it's not uh, it's not therapy; it's theatre." But I've also heard people say, "Well, it's not theatre; it's training. It, it, it's a new way of training for men." Excellent. And what we, what I'll do, Craig, is I'll put the link to your business and your retreats, etc., in the description. So if anyone's listening or watching this, they can go and click and check that out. Cool. Um, my final question is what I tend to do is I'll get my guests to either look back or forward. And I think in terms of what we've reflected on, I'm going to kind of ask you a question in terms of your, your career path going forward. So when it comes to a point where you, you you retire, you see yourself out, and, and you, you you kind of re want to relax and come away from uh, the 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 jobs that you do. How would you like to be remembered? Well, firstly, I'll never retire unless I get sick. Okay, <laughs> um, I'd like to be remembered for being a man who explored the frontiers of human transformation and wasn't afraid to be different for what reason um the reason is to inspire the ones that come after me 
Excellent. Where can listeners or viewers find you, Craig? Are you on social media? Yeah. Um, first of all, you can check out my personal website, craigwhitementoring.com. Uh, Craig White Mentoring is also on Instagram. Craig White is on LinkedIn. And you can find Men Without Masks, which is my group, Work With Men. Menwithoutmasks.com is a website. And men underscore without masks is uh, our Instagram Excellent. Well, we'll put all those links in the description as mentioned so that people can go and, and click and check that out. From a personal point of view, Craig, I just want to say thank you for your time. Um, your energy is is fantastic and listening to you in terms of uh, exploring well-being as well as sports performance and culture is, is, is very interesting as well. So I just want to thank you for, for your time and uh, good luck in the future. Yeah, thanks, man. Thanks for asking some good questions. It's a privilege. Mm-hmm.